<laughs> yep. Naomi, you know, great job on your address. Thank you. And I think you know, people are getting a sense of you know, why we were so excited about you. Your, your depth of knowledge and understanding of you know, public history, education, the community, you know, made you this really strong candidate. Um, but I want to talk about kind of this transition. You talked a little bit about this intergenerational. I'm a baby boomer. Uh, you're you know, younger, so it's like a passing of the next generation. But it's also kind of this interesting passing in terms of, you know, I'm you know, by training an engineer, a builder, and you know, I've, I've over the last 27 years have have built things. And you're an educator and a historian. I'm, I'm curious when you see what we've built. What are some ideas you have in terms of you know, taking it the next step? Yeah, so like applying that kind of educator lens to the organization, what I imagine for Densho is that it's been around now for almost three decades and that we can kind of see ourselves as uh, real leaders in the area of community archives, in public history, in really community grounded history. Um, and so I think that we could start thinking ourselves as a teaching organization. Like what does that look like if we sort of look at our organization as an opportunity to teach others who might be interested in doing this, something similar. Um, I studied this sort of intergenerational shift in Nikkei organizations in the US and Canada for my doctoral research. And what kept coming up with the younger staff was that they would sort of recognize that these kinds of JA organizations didn't exist for those that founded it when they were mm -hmm. in their 20s and their 30s and that it was a real opportunity that you could create and have a career a real professional pathway in working and serving in your community and, and so that I think is such an incredible asset I think it's such a gift that I be, am able to work in a JA organization and so I want to sort of apply that and also extend that to the next generation, but do that in a more formal way. So how could we really mentor and steward next gen uh, folks who are interested in archives in public history or digital humanities, technology, nonprofit management, and really sort of think of Densho as now real leaders in this JA history sort of space. But I think that um, already in just the last few months working with the staff and you, um, it's just been an incredibly welcoming and lovely place to be. And so I think that that's something that we need to be telling that story a lot more. Well, that's, that's really interesting. And you know, well, thank you for, for saying those words. But you know, this idea of you know, Dencho actually being a place for like young professionals, it's a career that you're right. You know, 30 years ago when I was starting, those organizations really weren't there. Um, and we only have a little bit of time. I mean, any yeah. questions, <laughs> the last question for me. Yeah, yeah, so I know like we've talked so much about kind of what this transition will mean and, and something that I drew from how you've allowed Densha to survive for 27 years is that you often talked about that you liked it being nimble, that you were able to adapt to change, to changes to technology. But um, what I would be interested to know is like, what would you like to remain unchanged? And what would you like to kind of be something that stays kind of core to what we do? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, most people always ask me about the change because, you know, they, they saw me as kind of this innovator and, and always kind of adapting to change. but. But the question of what to keep, I mean, you know, I think back to really the, the first meetings of Densho and, and why we were, you know, collecting these stories. And it was not just to collect stories, it was to really address these lessons. I mean, in particular, uh, I remember the, the conversations about not wanting this to happen to another community. And it opened up these discussions about xenophobia and racism mm -hmm. and how pervasive it is in, in our country and how we needed to really shine a light on this so that we could address it. And, and then we had this sort of audacious goal that um, you know, to really make change, every American needs to know this history and understand these lessons. And, uh, and so this kind of opened up another, I think, key thing that I would love to see um, you know, stay with Densho. It's this concept of sharing and collaboration. Mm -hmm. That the very early model of Densho is, you know, we're gonna collect all these, these materials. And we have a, like a thousand oral histories, mm -hmm. over a hundred thousand historic photographs and documents, a, a big encyclopedia, it goes on and on. We offer all those things for free. I mean, you know, they're there to be used. And I think in the spirit of sharing, other individuals and organizations have seen that and they want to start collaborating. They said, you know, this makes sense. And when you have that, it's, it's easier to kind of collaborate mm -hmm. together. So this sense of being very open and sharing, I think, is, is really important. 
which, which kind of leads me to this next thing I want to you know, talk about. Um, you know, this foundation of sharing and uh, collaborating really comes from this foundation of support and generosity that I got from, you know, the Japanese American elders, I mean, the Niseis. And uh, so I have to, you know, tell a story. When we first started Densho and I went out and talked to the community in meetings, um, I, I would, you know, kind of sense and feel this, this reluctance or hesitancy from people about sharing their stories. And I think some of it is, was cultural, saying, oh, my story isn't that important, or you should interview someone else and don't do this. Um, but there was also a lot of pain, mm -hmm. and people saying, you know what, we really don't want to you know, kind of uncover yeah. these painful memories again, and the friction within the community. And as I was getting this resistance, uh, there was a, a woman, a, a, a Japanese American leader, Aki Kurose, and during one of those meetings, she stood up and spoke out, and, and you know, she calls me Tommy, and she says, you know, Tommy, you know, what you're doing is just so, so important, and I'm, I'm fully in support, and in fact, I'll be one of your first interviewers, mm -hmm. or interviewees, you know, kind of narrators. And, uh, and that really made a difference in terms of, I think, turning the tide in the community. And so after we did the interview with Aki, a few days later, she came to the office, and she, and she brought me something. Um, she brought me this, this trophy, it's a baseball trophy. She knew I loved sports, but she uh, you know, brought this and said, you know, this is for you. And I said, oh, so what, what's this for? And she says, well, it's, it's, it's a symbol. It's, it's, it's to show you that I'm supporting you, that it was a vote of confidence um, you know, to me. And uh, you know, I remember it was, it was something that I've, I've had on my desk ever since then. And when times got tough, I would, I would look at this. And so today, you know, on this um, day we're, we're transitioning, actually this moment, uh, what I'd like to do is, is make you now the official executive director of Dan Show. Thank you. And with this, I'm giving this trophy to you. You know, as my vote of confidence Thank you so in you, much. now me. And I just know what you do and how you would do it is what the organization needs. So thank you for doing this, and, and please take this. Oh, thank you so much. I hope to make you proud. No, you will. <laughs> thank you. Yeah.